गुड डे नमस्ते आदाब सत सरी अकाल ऑल काइंड ऑफ ग्रीटिंग्स वेलकम टू नेबर्स टॉकिंग आई हेयर इज आयशा सदीका फॉर नया दौर टी वी टूडे वी हैव अ वेरी रिनाउंड एकेडमिक एंड जर्नलिस्ट अमंगस विद आस प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर क्रिस्टॉफ जेफलो हु इज अ प्रोफेसर ऑफ साउथ एशियन पॉलिटिक्स एंड हिस्ट्री एट साइंस फो Paris and King's College India Institute he has written several books on Pakistan and India and his latest being a book about Modi and India uh, talking about Hindu nationalism explaining everything that we need to know uh, you know about politics in India so welcome to the show uh, dr jeffelo thank you um, aisha <clears throat> you know the reason i thought we i talked to you today is because you're someone who has seen south asia very closely and perhaps you could guide me and the viewers about what what is happening you know the restrictions on media uh in south asia generally but more specifically in india what's happening i mean uh there are the you know uh, liberal press is getting pushed around what's happening what do you make of it well you know it's not new uh, this is something we see uh, as early as we saw as early as 2014 and even before that um, in gujarat uh, when narendra modi was was chief minister there modi has a very complex relationship with the media um, that was probably largely due to the coverage of the gujarat pogrom by the uh, english press by the english speaking uh, media um as, as a result the, the, uh, as a good uh, i would say symptom uh, as a very revealing symptom of this uneasy relationship with the media um, he has never held a proper press conference this is something uh, that starks that is in stark contrast with his predecessors so there is there is this uh, i would say past uh, experience but yes things have uh, somewhat gradually steadily uh, become worse and worse uh, we 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 have for instance instances of intimidation of journalists uh, as early as the mid 20 tent when you saw ravish kumar from ndtv in the uh, barkadat um uh, rana ayub uh, intimidated um by by trolls under strong pressure and you have in 2017 the murder of gauri lankesh uh, a journalist yeah. based in bangalore who, who was the culminating point uh, so somewhat of this trend of targeting individual journalists now um, and and in the case of gori lankesh by the way um, the question is not so much who killed her but uh, the way it has been uh, received uh, publicly uh, uh, some some mla bgp mla for instance uh, uploading uh, the uh, assassination uh, nobody condemning uh, the murder of of gori language uh, on the bgp side uh, that was really disturbing now there is a systematic attitude policy vis-a-vis uh, the media that sometimes calls to mind the way indira gandhi dealt with the media especially during the emergency for instance the government uses ads uh, as a tool and 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 could cut off advertisements to 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 major newspaper groups which made things very complicated for them and another another um technique uh, has to do with uh, raids you know the 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 cbi the central bureau of investigation or or, or the income tax department uh, conduct uh, raids and um, as early as 2015 2016 we saw uh, for instance pranoy roy the co-founder of ndtv targeted um by one of these raids there there was at that time um 
a press conference when the eminent lawyer Fali Nariman said this is an attack on press and media. But others have been attacked. Uh, the Raghav Ball, the founder of the Quint, was uh, attacked the same way. And systematically, you've had the Editors Guild of India uh, issuing communiques, re trying to resist this. But it has not it has not made any substantial impact, and, and you've had other um, very disturbing. But you know, but 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 uh, you know, Dr. Jaffalo, I'm sure uh, you would also uh, agree that this is a trend that you see across South Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, it is happening. I mean, if you look at Human Rights Watch report, the number of journalists dying, being killed in Pakistan. Look at Bangladesh, the same thing. I mean, do you see this authoritarian trend in um, in South Asia? Yeah, you can certainly look at the trend um, as, as a subcontinental one. Now, India till recently was an exception. You know, the kind of freedom, the kind of mm. liberty uh, newspapers, journalists enjoyed. Do remember how Manmohan Singh was targeted uh, in 2012, 2013 during the Anna Azare movement against corruption, for instance? Yeah. And they could continue to publish whatever they wanted. That was yeah. only mm -hmm. that was only 10 years ago. <laughs> and, 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 sure. the, and, and the scene has completely changed. And it has changed not only because of the regime change, so to speak, or the transformation of the political system, but also because of the way uh, capitalism has prevailed mm. over the, 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 the media scape. You know, what is the problem in many cases? In many cases, the problem is the media outlet belongs to a company, uh, a company that is doing many other things. And, and this company needs the clearance of the government for the many other things they are do doing. You know, they are conglomerates. And uh, if they want to continue to do their business, they have to fall in line. And, and you have a very uh, good example with the uh, uh, ABD group, for instance, in, in, in uh, West Bengal, based in West Bengal, not, not the worst place in terms of uh, a particular uh, regime, but uh, the uh, ABD, ABP uh, uh, group had to tell uh, P.P. Bajpai to stop his show and he has been led off. A journalist has been led off because uh, he, he did not uh, respect, so to speak, or speak respectfully of the prime minister. And that was because of business consideration. Same with Bobby Gosh. Bobby Gosh was the editor-in-chief of the Hindustan Times. He had started um, a, a track, uh, a aid tracker uh, for, for tracking uh, aid speeches and also uh, killings of um, lynchings of, of, of Muslims. Uh, and uh, he was uh, shown the door uh, and had to go back to New York uh, because the owners of the uh, Hindustan Times uh, could not, could not uh, live with this kind of attitude. And you but, have a last but not the least development, just to complete on this, on, in, in this vein, you have the creation of new channels. You know, Republic TV is the case in point. It's an amazing phenomenon when uh, uh, Sandra Shekharan on the one end and um, Anab Goswami on the, other end, on the other end create a company that is dedicated to the promotion of the new dispensation, the new government. And that is a business and it makes money uh, also. So we have to factor in this, uh, this dimension, the, the rise of crony capitalism or, or the entry of crony mm. capitalism in the media. And the, last, and the last but not the least in this series is of course Gautam Adani uh, becoming the owner of NDTV. Uh, is on his way. Let 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 me ask you then. Uh, you know, and and I'd refer to your book. Um, you know, on ethnic nationalism in India. I mean, this is something that you have written about extensively. So, why is it that this 
ethnic nationalism can capture the media, but the alternative political system, you know, the Congress party, uh, Rahul Gandhi, uh, I mean, that crowd has uh, been, you know, unable to do it. Well, I think the two factors I have listed so far, the attitude of the government on the one hand, the role of cronies, crony capitalists on the other hand, uh, are, are very important valuables. Now, okay. there is something more. Uh, the coverage of the opposition is very limited these days. You know, you, you mm. have to look at social media for realizing that, well, Congress, Raul Gandhi, is really making some change at the grassroots level at the moment, walking from Kanyakumari yeah. to Srinagar. None of the mainstream media, none of the uh, mainstream channels will show anything uh, of that kind. So we have to be careful. Uh, yes, the opposition is not in a position to um, make any difference by using the usual channels, but there are still uh, there is still some some resistance, and also on the media scape. The wire, scroll in, uh, you know, the caravan are, are still um, articulating some dissenting voices. So, also, um, what is happening? I mean, in Modi's India, um, and and if you could also elaborate, uh, you know, your thesis about ethnic nationalism in in India. Uh, could you further elaborate what you mean by that? And how is India changing with well, that kind in, of a concept? Yeah, in the book, I try to show that there are three um, parallel or uh, sequences uh, in, in, in the making of, of Modi's India. One is uh, national populism. You know, th th there was okay. Indudva before. Indudva is not new. Indudva is 100 years old. But it remained a, a very um, small, marginal political movement. It could capture the imagination of the people the moment Narendra Modi articulated Indudva and populism, a, a populist discourse, a way to relate directly to the people, to the poor people, to the backward people. He is himself part of what is known as a backward caste in India, that's the plus vote. It could bring a very important new electorate uh, on the BGP um, in 2014. Then once in office, he introduced what I call, what in fact is known in political science as um, ethnic democracy, ethni an ethnicization. Okay. Of, you can call it majoritarianism. It is, it is the same way. To, to, to describe this uh, new dispensation, which means that majorities, Hindus in that case, uh, prevail. They prevail okay. over minorities, minorities becoming second class citizens. And Muslims, and to some extent Christians, are becoming second class citizens in India because de facto they don't have the same rights as others. Uh, and, and they are not represented the way they used to be represented in parliament, in, in different institutions. And at, and at the uh, grassroots level, you see this form of fear that is uh, due to different campaigns, you know, anti-love jihad campaigns, anti-land jihad campaigns, uh, uh, Garvapsi, uh, something that is, um, aimed at reconverting uh, Muslims and Christians, and of course, cow protection campaigns, which uh, resulted in, in fear. And the third and last step um, is what we call in political science, uh, electoral authoritarianism. There are elections every five years. In fact, elections are very important for all the populists to, to, to get the legitimacy they need for for prevailing over institutions. There are elections and therefore the mandate is there. The man, the strong man can say, 
I am the people. The people is behind me. But elections are not a level playing field anymore because of the media in the first place, but okay. because of but because of money as well, because the money that is spent during the election campaign is, is much more than uh, what the opposition can spend. And between elections, you have institutions which have been captured. Uh, you look at okay. the Central Bureau of, of Investigation, you look at the Election Commission, uh, and you look at the judiciary itself. Some of, some of these institutions have given up and have fallen in line. Um, because of fear, because of intimidation, but also sometimes because they adhere to the ideology that is now the only game in town. Uh, and uh, in the okay. case of the judiciary, it's a very complicated scenario. Uh, the Supreme Court of India, which used to be the most independently minded Supreme Court in the world, uh, it, it is clearly changing and is not, not opposing the government for years now. Certainly, certainly. Um, but so, which are when you when you look at India, where do you see the light? I mean, are there channels? Are there uh, media groups which are trying to push back? Is it possible well, at all to push back? You know, it's very difficult to say because you can argue that the point the point of no return has not been reached yet. Uh, and, and you see that especially in states like... Well, what, what do you mean by point of no return? Well, the point of no return would mean uh, it will, it is still possible to regain the kind of freedom of expression, the kind of democracy uh, that India enjoyed 10 years ago or, or, or 15 years ago. I, I, I do think so. Now, every year that passes makes this return to status quo ante more complicated uh, because right. institutions are infiltrated and the mindset the mindset of the majority is also um, somewhat affected partly because of uh, propaganda including uh, in, in in the education system the the the, the right. rewriting of textbooks is only one of the many instances of this transformation so there is still a civil society, there is still an opposition, uh, but uh, to to transform, to return to, to what uh, India was 10 years ago is very unlikely in, in the near future. And uh, the opposition will have to get united first for making a difference mm. because they're very divided. And yeah. if, even if they are united, uh, to make to, to to win against BGP will probably be very difficult. You know, I was just thinking, and and I'm sure it comes to your mind. Uh, we have a you know media group like the Via, uh, you know, which is trying to present an uh, anti Modi or a you know non-conformist uh, perspective, and it's getting pushed around as well. I mean, I'm I'm sure you heard the recent report of uh, police visiting uh, the the editor uh, and owner Siddharth Vadrajan and you know he's being there is there is an effort to gag him so how much can when systems are penetrated how much can media alternative media push back is it possible at all it's very difficult it's very difficult and you have you have to use all kinds of channels. Um, social media probably is uh, a, a, an effective uh, channel for communication. That's why, by the way, um, Twitter, WhatsApp, Facebook are very much under control uh, in India. And, uh, there is an, there is a kind of complicity between these institutions platforms and and the government on, on, on many grounds and and also never forget that um internet is uh, shut down internet shutdowns are more frequent in india than in most of the uh, neighboring countries even so there are channels for communicating dissenting voices they are still there they are still 
existing. We are not in China, far from that. But uh, it's difficult. And uh, it's difficult because there is this state control and surveillance even. And never forget the Pegasus story, something that uh, uh, the journalist yeah, uh, <laughs> mentioned. But it's also difficult because of the Indudva hegemony in terms of mindset. No, it's a little bit what you could see in Pakistan and in other uh, Islamic countries. Red lines are very difficult to cross back, to reverse. Who will mm. dare to change the anti-blasphemy law in Pakistan? No one. Who will right. dare to change the anti-cow protection, you know, the, the, the anti-cow slaughter rules in India? No one. That's why. That's why you see a kind of mindset, ideology that becomes all pervasive. So there is no alternative thinking. And then right. no game, well, no other game in town and, and no pluralism or pluralism within limits. Limits which you know, that, not there. That, that, you know, that reminds me again that, you know, you have a lot of political activity happening broader, broadly in the region. Um, you know, look at what is happening in Iran. People are protesting, pushing back. Uh, now, of course, India and Pakistan are not those alternatives, right? Uh, because here, majoritarianism is kind of sinking in. It's becoming prominent. And I think what makes it, gives it an opportunity is because when people see, ordinary Indians see India as being the success story, then they also probably take pride in in in, 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 in and whatever Modi government is offering. Would you agree? Yes, I agree. And uh, you know what we see on the Iranian side, I'm glad you referred to that, shows how difficult it is for civil societies to take over power again. Repression is so odd, so difficult. And we saw that in most of the Arab Springs countries. That's why it's difficult to, to be optimistic uh, when the kind of grasp on a society has reached that level. Very difficult to to put the uh, genius in his lamp again. Oh, God. So, <laughs> Dr. Jeffalov, thank you so much for your time. Indeed, you know, uh, it is a depressing thought what is happening in South Asia, in India, and in particular, which we all looked up to as a great democracy. It's still a democracy, electoral democracy. Yet, there are things happening which are taking it in a very different direction. Um, and, you know, one hopes that one day the civil society in India will rise up. There will be a challenge from within. Thank you for sharing your time. Thank you, Ayesha.